Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, kids. Here we are again, another week of Bible lessons. We're going to go through some more today. Now, first of all, I want you to think, well, for that, I'm going to do something strange today. Normally, every week, I tell you, go get your Bible, right? Well, today, I'm going to tell you to go get two Bibles, okay? It's going to be complicated. You need a full Bible with the Old Testament, and then you need at least... A New Testament, okay? You probably want something that hangs open. Now, if you're watching this with one of your brothers or one of your sisters, well, then one of you can use the Old Testament. One of you can use the New Testament. And maybe, depends on how good you are, some of you littler ones might want to have Mommy and Daddy help you find some passages because we've got to look them up today for this to work, all right? So, if you haven't got them, go get two Bibles. Pause the recording. We'll wait for you. And get back here with two Bibles an Old Testament, and a New Testament. Okay? Got them? All right. You got them. Okay. So, now, what are some of the things people try to predict? Ever thought about that? Of course, one of the famous ones is the weather. Is it going to rain today? Is it going to snow today? Is it going to be sunny today? Is it going to be cloudy? Is it going to be windy? Because that can have an effect on our lives. What we do today, what we do tomorrow... <clears throat> whether we want to do something today, is it going to be dry enough for the paint we do? Yeah, those kind of things. And they have all sorts of instruments they use now, and they got the satellites now, and they got the radar, and they can do a pretty good job telling you what the weather's going to be like for the next few days. And they can give you usually a pretty good idea what it's like for the next week, but sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong, right? All right, what's another thing? Well, some people are really into this. They try to predict sports stuff. Is their team going to win? Is their team going to lose? Which team's going to win? Matter of fact, when you start a season, like football season, baseball season, basketball season, people will get their little chart and will have all the teams listed and they'll try to figure out which team's going to win at the end of the season. You know, they're trying to make a prediction. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're wrong, all right? Another one, something you kids might not think about or worry about, is financial stuff. People want to know if the stocks they bought are going to go up or are they going to go down. Is this a good time to buy something? Is this a good time to sell something? They want to know what the interest rates are going to do because that might affect what they're doing. They want to know what different things are going to sell for. Usually oil is a pretty big one. How, how much expense is that going to be? And they want to put all that together and they make predictions. And guess what? Sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're wrong. All right? And then there's the other one, us American people, you know, politics. People want to know who's going to get elected. Who's not going to get elected. If they get elected, are they really going to do what they say they do? What's the whole Congress going to try and do this year? What kind of laws might they try and pass? Okay, they try and predict those things. And there's people that spend a lot of time reading news articles and things about the politicians, and they make those predictions, and sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong, all right? So what do you think a prediction has to do with our lesson today? You know, we've been looking at the kings. We started here with King Saul, and we've been through all sorts of different kings. Solomon built the temple, all right? The kingdom split. We saw a whole lot of bad kings over in the northern kingdom, and we saw some good ones and bad ones in the southern kingdom, all right? We had good kings, we had bad kings, we had northern kings, we had southern kings. We even had a couple really bad queens, if you remember, all right? So we've been looking at all those. It kind of looks like chaos, doesn't it? All sorts of things going on. One person dies, one person kills another, another king comes to power. What a mess. Yeah. Okay. And you might think after watching all this, well, God just kind of gave up. He's just left it all under control. God's not working at all. Yeah, you might think that. But what we find and what we're going to look at today is even during this time, God was still working. And even though we had prophets that were given a lot of bad news about the judgment coming up, he was still giving them some good news. He was making predictions about who was going to come that was going to fix all these problems. Who do you think I'm talking about? 
Yeah, he was telling the different, God was telling the different prophets about the coming of what they call the Messiah. But today, us people here at this time, we call him Jesus because we know he came, all right? We're going to look at two of those prophets. We got our handy dandy books of the Bible chart, all right? And the books on this chart are in the order they're in the Bible. And I've told you before, that's not the order they were written, all right? Yes. Because the stories we've been looking at about the kings have been here in 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. But then I told you we have these prophets down here, the books of prophecy. And we have the two groups, the major prophets and the minor prophets. Not that one's more important than the other. These guys just wrote bigger books. All right? And most of these books have the prophet's name is the book name. All right? We're going to look at two of them. We're going to look at a major prophet and a minor prophet. We're going to look at the minor prophet named Austin. Micah, right here. All right? And we're going to look at one of the major prophets named Isaiah. And we're going to look for the things that are called prophecies. They're predictions about what's going to happen in the future. But of course, with God, are they really predictions? God already knows. Maybe some of your older ones really want something to blow you away today, okay? So here's the thought for today. You got it? Not only did God create matter that we're made of, you know, stuff we can touch, 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 touch. Not only did he create energy that powers all this stuff, but God created space and even time. It's separate from God. God's apart from time. Matter of fact, part of him being omnipresent is not just being all over the whole universe at once. It's about being over all the time in the universe. So when God makes a promise, it's already pretty much happened for God. All right? So when he makes these promises, they're as good as done. And that's what we're going to look at today. Matter of fact, we're going to look at five prophecies that these different prophets made. And that's why we got the two Bibles. So over here, I got my Old Testament Bible. And we're going to read some of the prophecies that God made through those two prophets about Jesus coming. And what Jesus does. And how Jesus dies. And then we're going to turn around and we're going to go to our New Testament Bible. And we're going to see how it worked out. Ever done that before? All right. That's what we're going to do. So now you need to take your Old Testament Bible and you need to go to Micah chapter 5. Now Micah is one of those little books that's hard to find. It's in there with the minor, minor prophets. You know all those names you don't know much about after the book of Daniel. All right. So you got to find him. Find this Micah. Well, Daniel. Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. Have you found it yet? All right. We're going to go to Micah, and we're going to chapter 5. And I'm going to read verse 2, but I hope you have your Bible open so you can read with me, all right? Let's go to Micah chapter 5, verse 2. See what it says here about the coming Messiah, all right? But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, let yet out of thee he shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. So there is a place listed in that verse. That's our first prophecy. Did you catch it? The name of a city. Look back at it if you didn't catch it. What was that city? Yeah, it was Bethlehem. And it says in here, Bethlehem of Ephrata. You know, like here, our church, we say that we're in Wakarusa, Indiana. When I grew up, I grew up in a little town called Quincy, and we called it Quincy, Michigan. And there's actually a Quincy in another state. 
right? That's not the Quincy I'm from. This says Bethlehem, Africa. God was pointing right to the particular city that the Messiah is going to come from. Okay? And that's what they called in the Old Testament times, Bethlehem of Africa. Now we're going to get your New Testament Bible. And this book's easier to find. This is Matthew, first book of the New Testament, all right? So look that up. Go to Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Getting there? Yep. Matthew. We're going to go to chapter 2. Chapter 1 is just a long list of names. All right. Chapter 2, and we're going to read verse 1. Okay, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. And this goes back to when the wise men came looking for Jesus and they were asking questions. And this is the question they said. Where is he that is the born king of the Jews? For we have seen his car, star and are come to worship him. And you remember back then, Herod had to go ask the wise men, where is this child going to be born because Herod didn't want to hear this. He wanted to be the king forever. He didn't want anybody else becoming king. He didn't like these guys really coming there and asking this question. So Herod asked the Jewish leaders, where is this Messiah guy going to be born? <coughs> I don't even know if Herod believed much of the Messiah himself, but this is what those Jewish leaders said. And they said unto him, unto Bethlehem. All right. So they went there and Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which it says right there in verse 1. Now, after this, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. See, it's a little different there. It says Bethlehem of Judea, but that's not really a problem. Because this whole area now, that we've gone through all the kings and we get done and we go through a whole bunch of other stuff we're going to talk about. By the time we get to the New Testament, there's a different empire in charge of the world. And this part of the world is now called Judea because the Jews live there. So this is Bethlehem of Judea. Same thing. God's prediction, which isn't much a prediction for God because God knows what's going to happen, that the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem, even though it was written 700 years before it happened, which is about it's more than uh, three times we've had the United States of America. That's how ahead of time it was. Even though God made the promise then, it still came true, the very town that... The Old Testament prophets heard from God being the place where Jesus is going to burn is where the New Testament says it happened. Just like that. All right? That's prophecy number one. Prophecy number two. It's actually in the same verse in Micah. So you don't have to turn anywhere. All right? Micah 5.2. We're going to go to the end of the verse. All right? I'll read the whole thing, though. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Gia, Judea, yet out of thee shall he come forth that is to be the ruler of Israel, here we go, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. That sounds strange. Going forth have been from old, everlasting. Now us humans, we're only what you can call like half eternal. We're going to live forever in either heaven or hell, one way or the other. We don't dissolve we don't go away our physical bodies are going to die but our souls are going to keep going on forever but us humans had a time when we started when we were made right we don't go back to eternity past but this says that this new messiah is going to be from everlasting hmm how's that going to work out well get your new testament bible and we're going to go to John chapter 1. All right, the last gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So keep going through the gospels. Go on to the gospel of John. All right, and we'll go to the first chapter of the gospel of John. So John chapter 1. And we're going to read verse 1 and 2. And this was written by the Apostle John. He was the last one to write a gospel. And he had a different way of introducing Jesus in his gospel. Let's listen to it. 
In the beginning was the Word. Okay, take a look at that. See that capital W on Word there? Yeah. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All right? And if we keep reading down there, we find out that this thing that the Apostle John is calling the Word, he's talking about Jesus. And what does he say about Jesus in verse 2 and in verse 1? In the beginning, and this was even before the beginning of the world, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. He's saying that Jesus is God. Jesus is part of the Trinity. Jesus is just as much God as God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And how long has God been around? Right, God's always been there. In fact, God made time, so he exists separate from time. So does that meet our Old Testament prophecy? Why, of course it does. The going forth have been from everlasting. That's the only human. Jesus is the only human, because he was also human, but he was also God, that came, became human, the only one that's been around forever. The rest of us had a time when we started. So we've got two prophecies now that are in the Old Testament, very detailed, that have been answered in the New Testament. Let's go to prophecy number three. For this, we still stay in Micah, in your Old Testament Bible, in Micah, but we're going to chapter 7. All right, Micah chapter 7, in your Old Testament Bible there. You getting it? That's probably not too hard to find. And we're going to read verses 18 through 19. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity, that passes by a transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delights in mercy. He will turn again, he will have compassion upon us, he will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Now there is a strange description, because in the last lessons we've seen how God punishes sins. He's already wiped out the northern kingdom. They've been taken over, they've been deported, northern kingdom's done for. And God judged them because of all the idols they did. And when they did idols, they did all sorts of wicked things too. And now we got this verse here saying God's going to, what kind of stuff did they mention? Hmm. Pardoneth, then we have iniquity. Passes by transgression. All right. He delighteth in mercy. What do the words iniquity and transgression mean? We have a short little three-letter word we use for those. You know what it is? Sin. Right. Transgressions and iniquity are sin, but God's going to be merciful, and he's not going to be mad forever. He's found a way to forgive sin. All right? Any human ever been away, found a way to forgive sins, something people did against God? No. Only Jesus did. How did he do that? <clears throat> We're now going to go to our New Testament Bible, all right, to see how this is fulfilled. And we need to go back to 1 Peter, which is away past the Gospels in the, towards the end of the New Testament, all right? It's called 1 Peter. So look for 1 Peter, and we're going to do chapter 2. First Peter, chapter 2. Verse 24. We're going to see how it worked out that this Messiah, this one coming that's been around forever, can forgive sins. Even though we know God has to judge it because we've seen him do it here in the past. All right, so hopefully you're at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, 
having died to sins, might live for righteousness, whose stripes we are healed. Alright, so here we see it. How did this Old Testament passage about Jesus being able to pardon sin get fulfilled in the New Testament? Because Jesus took our penalty for us. Right. Now hopefully you've accepted this. Hopefully you've asked Jesus and told him, I want to take advantage of what you did to us to pardon our sins, to pardon our iniquities and our transgressions. I want to trust in your death because Jesus took our sins and then died to pay the penalty that we should do because there are sins. But Jesus took care of that for us. All right. So that's our third prophecy. Jesus is done a part in sin, and we see Jesus did by his death. All right? Prophecy number four. Ready? We're going to jump books now in the Old Testament. We're going to go to the book of Isaiah, and it's actually forward in the Bible. All right? So you've got to find yourself the book of Isaiah, which is before Daniel. All right? We have Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastics, Song of Solomon, and then Isaiah, first book of the major prophets. You finding it there? Go in the book of Isaiah and chapter 7. All right. And now we're going to read about something that just doesn't happen. We get it was prophesied that it would. All right. So hopefully you're with me now. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. See, this was back. The Jews always wanted a sign. They wanted God to show them some miracle so they could believe what he was saying. And as Isaiah's writing this book of cursings, it's going to happen if this southern kingdom doesn't start obeying God. He throws in this one verse of help in verse 14. All right? And this is what God told Isaiah to write. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. All right? Got two different parts of that. First one is, Jesus' birth was unlike anybody else. We're not going too deep in this, but it takes a daddy and a mommy to have a kid. And that's the way every human's ever been except for Jesus. He did not have a human dad. God was the one that helped Mary get the baby going. So he did have Joseph, which was his adopted, adopted stepdad who took care of him. Did a real good job, I guess. But he didn't have an earthly father because his father was God. So this is what this verse is talking about. That it's going to be coming from this woman that, and not a man. How did that work out? Let's read Matthew again. Go back to Matthew. And we're going to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to read three verses. 21, 22, and 23. So hopefully you can find your way back to Matthew. And three verses now. All right. This one actually has the prophecy rolled into it. This is when an angel was talking to Joseph. Because Joseph didn't know what to do with this situation. Things didn't look too good. He was a little worried. What to do with Mary, who wasn't quite his wife yet. Yet they were supposed to be getting married soon. All right? and, the whole, and he has this dream, and this is what this angel in his dream said. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from his sins. So all this was done that might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So again, we see him being born here in the New Testament, without an earthly father. Even though Joseph stepped in and became his stepfather there, we see that happening just like the Old Testament said it was going to. 
And we even see this name thing coming there. The Old Testament said he's going to be called Emmanuel. Now he got the name Jesus. But what does Emmanuel mean? It says there, right at the end of verse 23. Okay? Emmanuel, which is translated, I mean, that's what it means, God with us. That's the meaning of Emmanuel. And Jesus is the only one that can be God with us because that's the only time God has become a human and lived among people. So he fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy about being born of a virgin and being named Emmanuel, being called Emmanuel, and we see it here in the New Testament again. All right. Ready? Prophecy number five. And this one, we still stay in our Old Testament book of Isaiah, but we're going to go back a ways. We're going to go to chapter 53. A lot of chapters in Isaiah. So you're in Isaiah in your Old Testament Bible. We're going to go to chapter 53. And I'll give you a little while to find that here because it's important. I want you to follow along. All right. Old Testament Bible. Isaiah 53, I'm going to read you verses 5 through 7. And here's described how the Messiah is going to die and why. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and that's our sin. He was bruised for our iniquities, sin again. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. He's the one that fixed this. He's the one that took the punishment. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him, laid upon the Messiah, laid upon Jesus, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He brought as the lamb to the slaughter. No, that's back when they used to, well, they still do probably. Kill the lamb so they can eat the meat. All right, marked in there. As a sleep before a sheep before its shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. All right. So here we have a description that the Messiah is going to die. And it's going to be a terrible death. He's going to be beat up. He's going to have stripes on him from where he was being beaten. All right. And there's all sorts of places. In our New Testament Bible, we could look up that story. What do we call that story in the New Testament? We teach it here every year. We call it the Easter story. Story where Jesus died on the cross. We just looked at that a couple months ago. We saw where Jesus kind of willingly went and did that. He knew it was coming. He could have stopped it. He didn't. And he took the punishment for our sins. And we can look at that in all the Gospels and the whole rest of the New Testament relies on the fact that Jesus died for us that way. So there's five prophecies <coughs> where something in the Old Testament, God told us what was going to happen, and we can see how it happened in the New Testament. And it happens just like he said. There's some people running around today who say they can predict the future and they give a lot of vague little things. And then something like that happens. I mean, things like something is going to fall from the sky this year. And sure enough, something falls from the sky and they say, yeah. But they're not even always right. However, when God makes promises, they come true. Matter of fact, in this particular Bible I've been doing the Old Testament from today, it's a study Bible, which means people took the Word of God and they add in notes and references so you can look things up. They also put in these different tables like this page here. And this page has in it 34 different prophecies just of Jesus' death. We got details in here, all right? We got details about when it got dark that day. We've got details about the people despising him. We got the details about people casting lots for his clothes. We got details about the time of the day he was going to die. We've got details 
of him making an intercession for the transgressor. Remember he did that with one of the thieves on the cross there. We got all these details. And again, they did the same thing on this chart I just do. They just had a longer list. A whole list of Old Testament passages and a whole list of New Testament passages where it was provided, where it was, where it was fulfilled. It actually came true. All right. What do we learn from all these prophecies? Well, I can think of three things. Maybe you can think of another one. If you do, come tell me when you see me next time. All right. The first thing we can see, even though all this bad stuff has been happening that we've been talking about, good kings, bad kings, good kings that were in trouble with other bad kings, wicked queens, grandmas killing their grandkids. I mean, it was terrible. God was still in control. He was still working out his plan. He still had a plan to work out, and he was given the details about how he's going to fix all this stuff by sending Jesus. All right? That's one thing we can learn from these prophecies. God still cared. God was still being merciful. Even though he had to punish the countries for not obeying him and worshiping idols, he was still merciful. He was still giving them a chance. He was still going to fix the problem. <clears throat> Number two of things we can learn from the prophecies. We see in here prophecy after prophecy, details of how Jesus was going to be born, what he was going to do when he was alive, and how he was going to die, and why. And then when we go to the New Testament, we see all those things happening the way God promised, the way he said it was going to happen. Some of these being 700 years. <clears throat> Matter of fact, the first prophecy of Jesus was back with Adam and Eve. And that was a long, 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 long time ago. It wasn't very detailed then, but that's the first one. God's been promising this for a long time, and when he promises it, we've seen it happen. All right? Well, what does that mean? There are still some promises here in the Bible that haven't come true yet. They're going to come true sometime in our future. We rely on them. We know that God's going to take those who believe in him to heaven. We know we won't be here at the end of the earth because he's going to take us out before that. We know he's not going to say, eh, I changed my mind. There really isn't a heaven anyways. I just kind of made it up as a joke. No, that's not the way God works. We can see it here. He makes a promise and he keeps them exactly the way he said it was going to be. <coughs> and when we study the Bible, we can look at it and see <coughs> prophecies he's made in the future and we know they're going to be worked out to the same detail that they were here, the ones we have seen fulfilled. And here's the third thing we can learn. These prophecies, made a long time before they happened, prove that this Bible is the Word of God. Someday, you might have a friend come up to you and say, What are you doing with this old book? <coughs> Why do you keep reading that? Why are you doing the things in there it tells you to do? How do you know that it's true? And there's several answers you can give them. But one of them you can say is, Look at all the things God told us were going to happen that did happen. And then you can say, find another book like that. You find a book that has those many details given so many hundreds of years in advance, and they still happened. And you can share that with them and say, that's how, one of the reasons we know this book is what God gave us, and the things he tells us is true, like we need to trust Jesus as our Savior. All right? <clears throat> well, I hope you enjoyed this little different lesson today. Instead of talking about kings, we talked about prophecies. They're kind of exciting if you stop to think about them. All right? And we can see how God's working. But let's pray. We'll be back next week, and we'll look at more of God's Word. All right? Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you we can think of your promises here and see how you fulfill them. And we can trust in you to fulfill the promises that you've made to us that are going to happen in the future. In thy name, amen.